Okay, everybody. Round of applause. Let's get the blood flowing. Yeah. You see before you a man who at four o'clock this morning didn't think he was going to make it here, but he's somehow here thanks to coffee and, and fry breakfasts. And my esteemed friend and colleague, Laurie Phipps, here on timekeeping. He's been great. Round of applause for Laurie. Now, just to make things a bit interesting, all the speakers are expecting five minutes, but there'll be a random one person will only get two and a half minutes just for the crack of it. I, let's pretend. We were pretending that it's there. Okay, we'll just start. We're already just going to be doing counting. We're doing a bit of singing then later on, and a bit of dancing and moving around. So we're all ready then for our gossip. We just want the whole crowd, even the people up in the posh seats. I would have loved you to be down here in the middle, but hey, you know, that's, that's okay. So anyway, I don't want really loud to kick off. We'll just do a count out and then the hands up on the gas. Are we ready? A hey! A two! A three! A four! A cooing! Gasta! Okay, I can rock and roll, I'm told. All right, I'm going to get back into serious mode and tell you about our unbundling project which we um, have been doing over the last two years looking at new models of teaching and learning at the intersection of marketization digitization and unbundling and today i'm going to be just talking about stakeholders and the contestations that are happening between the stakeholders and there is a poster outside which you can look at at leisure and the interesting thing, of course, is if you look at stakeholders in new models of teaching and learning, there are so many more than there used to be. There used to be teachers, students, and maybe some professional staff. And now, of course, there are a whole lot more setting agendas, policy makers, private companies, telecommunications companies, search engines, etc. And as the entire set of services unbundle, so do more and more stakeholders appear on the scene. And I was really interested just to look around ELT today at the new stakeholders who are part of our process of providing teaching and learning, some of which are private companies, some of which are university consortia, but they are now part of the process of creating new forms of curricula and provision. So our study, we looked at six universities in South Africa, seven in England, and we also looked at uh, six private companies who work in both South Africa and England. We looked at publicly available information. We interviewed senior decision makers in universities. We ran focus groups with academics, and we did surveys with students. And what we found was that for senior decision makers, there was an issue around an opportunity to increase access and reach and an opportunity to get third stream income. And they had very pragmatic attitudes towards working with private companies. There were tensions for them around core business and global competitiveness, this whole thing about the rankings. In South Africa, there was the need to survive austerity, and there's much more of a social justice imperative in South Africa than there is in England, where marketized discourses were much more common. Private companies generally considered universities slow and inexperienced, they were very interested in the brand and in building trust, and they see themselves as the pioneers and prefer entrepreneurial universities, and I couldn't resist this quote. I had to take all the rest out. But one of them said to our researcher, it's just like taking candy from a child when you negotiate with higher education institutions. They are clueless about how capitalism works and they will enter into agreements blind and be taken for a ride. We have more, but that one kind of sums it up. Academics were much more skeptical about the changing nature of universities and concerned about decision-making, agency, and top-down approaches. Now, I'm not really talking about uh, students today, but in terms of the contestations, we found that universities are balancing competing imperatives. They're actually stuck between a rock and a hard place around core business and generating third-stream income and this need to, rev to, to generate revenue, sometimes for their core business. Um, there's a tension across the whole higher education system as they become more differentiated. And there are negotiations, negotiations and some alignment between companies and university decision makers and their rationale for these partnerships. 
but there are definitely contestations between decision makers and academics and decision makers and academics and companies. And there, there were really strong differences of opinion. There are serious negotiations around the control of the academic project and control of teaching and around the question of outsourcing what's considered to be core business. And there's some real negotiation around the role of social capital, you know, the old boys network and how do we get to form these partnerships. So can I suggest if you're interested in this conversation, our MOOC on this topic starts next week. Two weeks of it, um, you know, it's not, it's, it's a conversation. Thanks very much. Well done, Laura. So, our next speaker is up. Get this out ready. Now, I think we have enough people who disregarded my asks and suggestions, so they're going to have the people in the posh seats are going to have to do all the counting on this one themselves. So you'll have to make up, because there's not that many of you, so you'll have to count really loud. So people just in the tiered seat, and the tiered seat only, you're going to do all the counting. Everybody else, just sit back, put your feet up, and listen to the loud cacophony of noise that the people in the posh seats are going to make. Are we ready? And only for the posh people. Are we ready? That, that was really good. That was really good. This side, not so good. <laughs> so I'm watching everybody. There's only about 28 of you, so I'm watching each and every one of you. Right? And I want all the people in the, in the poor seats to look at them and see who's not. <laughs> see who didn't count out loud. Are we ready? Only open the posh seats. Are we ready? Ah, uh, hey. Gosta. Well done. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sho, and I'm a postdoc at the University of Tokyo. I'm going to talk a little bit about the development of a new MOOC on English Medium Instruction, EMI. So EMI means teaching academic subjects in English, and it's different from teaching English itself. To begin with, let me explain some background on this project. So we have already witnessed the internationalization of higher education, and it's been synonymous with Englishization. We research in English, present our research in English, sometimes in five minutes, and we teach in English. The number of tertiary classes, courses, or even degree programs offered in English is increasing rapidly in non-anglophone countries like Japan, where the provision of EMI doubled in the last 20 years and nearly 30% of Japanese higher education institutions are now offering some form of EMI. Nevertheless, there is scarcity of training in how to teach in English. Researchers have also reported a lack of pedagogical guidelines for tertiary teachers who are assigned to teach in English. There is also a paucity of resources for such practitioners who need to develop their EMI competencies by which I mean not only English proficiency, but also various, various pedagogical skills, such as managing international classrooms. Given these challenges, the University of Tokyo is developing a new MOOC on EMI in close cooperation with the University of Edinburgh. The MOOC is called U Tokyo English Academia, which I shall call EA3. EA3 will be added to the U Tokyo English Academia series we launched EA1 in 2017 and EA2 in 2018. Both of them are online courses on academic English. So we are trying to help learners with the smooth transition from English as a subject to learn to English as a medium of their teaching. We use Open edX as a platform and EA has also already got 22,000 users enrolled. EA3 is comprised of 10 modules covering various topics such as what EMI is, why EMI has expanded in higher education across the globe, where EMI has increased, how EMI is conducted, and the perception and challenges faced by stakeholders such as teachers, students, administrators, and policymakers. 
Each module is comprised of pre-lecture activities that are designed to stimulate learners' interest. Lecture videos that explain the topics I mentioned earlier. Pots lecture quizzes for comprehension check. And discussion forums where learners exchange opinions. Discussion forums also serve as opportunities where learners can raise awareness of their own or other local contexts. So EMI is truly a global phenomenon, but challenges faced by the stakeholders I touched on earlier differ from context to context. In Japan, for example, one of the expected benefits of EMI is to improve learners' English proficiency, but it is highly questionable whether the content classes taught in English meet such an expectation. So our aim is to encourage learners to localize or tailor the global boom of EMI to their own local contexts. A major contribution of this project to practice is to tackle with the scarcity of resources for not only EMI teachers, but also those who develop and implement EMI training. The MOOC we are developing can be mixed with offline micro-teaching sessions where learners demonstrate their teaching and evaluate each other. The project also increases profile of EMI, which has been seldom told through MOOCs. So this is a brief overview of my project. The project has been delayed. In my abstract, I wrote, I'm going to present preliminary data collected from learners, but actually we haven't launched ESV. So I'm afraid I can't tell you much about research into this project, but I'll be happy to answer your questions if any. Thank you. No fun. Another perfect timing. Well done. Our next speaker is up. Are we feeling a bit tired? Are we okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll have to get the hands up, the swaying, and it's great. It's, it's like, yeah, the small lads all sitting together. It's like a bobsled team down the back there. He's like, absolutely. One fella there, his hairstyle is ruining the look for the other three lads. Yeah, he needs to go. Or shave the head. We already get the hands up, we're going to go left to right. Get the hands up. Come on this afternoon, I'm watching everybody. People in the park seat, get the hands up. Feet, come on. Are we ready? A hen. A doe. A tree. A car. A cooey. Costa. Thank you, everyone. Um, hello. I'm a bit off my game today because I'm, I have a common cold, so please forgive me if I don't make sense. Not that I make sense all the time. Um, so I'm the piñata lady. I don't know if you have seen my poster. Um, I won't get into the piñata metaphor. You, you can watch the video. There is a QR code. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about my experience of um, being a change agent. So I never saw myself as a change agent or as a leader, right? And I'm very new to be, to consider myself a change agent. So in my mind, a leader or leadership is for someone to tell me what to do. Um, I would say the gentleman in the picture will be the image of a leader for me. He would be a white man telling me what to do. So when I saw myself in this situation, I. I was clueless, so I, I did a PG cert and I wrote about my experience. So I wrote about organizing a TEL fest with a team of four people, the TEL team, right? So I, I read a lot about leadership. I'm not here to tell you about leadership. You can probably um, read a lot about it. There are different styles and you will probably favor one over another one. So I just wanted to share. I never saw myself as a leader and I was just thrown into that experience. Um, but anyone can be a leader, that's what I learned. So Telfest, I'm sure you have come across it. So I, I work with this team and we were tasked with um, creating a technology adoption strategy. So Telfest is fun, it sounds sexy, and it's positive. So, so some of the literature in leadership says that the way you engage people is through emotion. So you keep things fun, because change is difficult. How do you cope with change? 
No one likes change. It's really uncomfortable. It is a cognitive load. So we don't want more hassle in our lives. So when we are tasked with rolling out another, yet another technology to our staff, how do you do it? How do you pers persuade people that this is it? Because change is so fast, and next month is a different flavor. So everything you try to teach people, or look, this is so cool, you have to embrace it, it will change in two months. In a year, it will be a completely different thing. So Telfe sounded like a good strategy. So we organized it. There is a lot of um, positivity surrounding this. So it wasn't successful. 88% of change strategies fail. That's what the literature says. And I think I'm, I am an optimist, so I really am that kind of person that will just dive into things, and I always expect the, be the, the best outcome possible. But the truth is 88% 80 per, of change strategies fail, and I wasn't aware of that. So I was deeply disappointed that people wasn't, people wasn't as excited as I was about embracing technology. What a shock. So when I wrote my reflection about this, so I'm, I'm the child trying to break the piñata, right? It's this wonderful experience of trying something new and really embracing it. So then I, I'm, I'm here to give you a framework. Probably you know these things already because you're all pretty much very experienced, probably more experienced than I am. So people and process dynamics that you have to think about. So when it comes to people, the most important thing is people don't like change. So I feel like part of my job is to understand the psychology be to, be behind what motivates people. There are many different approaches, and I think it's our job to study a little bit about how do you reward people for being awesome. So I don't believe in punishment, so reward is the best way forward. And the process dynamics, I think clarity of the outcome. What does success look like to you and to the, your institution? And when you have this in mind, you have a clear vision. What is success like? What does it lo look like? What percentage of people do you want to use this new technology? Then you have a clear framework. And then you can say that you're not part of the 88% of failure. OK, I think that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> No phone, no phone. Yeah, I think it's more fun if you don't get a one minute warning, isn't it? It's more of a, yeah. I think that's. All right. I think we'll go for that. No more warnings. Uh, Ten seconds and that's it. Uh, you just have to wing it. Competition, dividing line, Hain, Doe, Tree, Carter, all together, Kuik, and their arms up in the air. I want to see who's going to the loudest side. Are we ready? We're going to start over here. Hello, um, I'm, I'm Chris Kennedy. I'm from Glasgow Dental School, part of University of Glasgow. And I'm, I'm sure you've all uh, been here this week and you've, you've all taken a look at my poster that's been downstairs since Tuesday, so I'm just going to work on the assumption that you've all memorised everything in there and I can just build from there. Um, the project that we were working on was a middle redevelopment, and I know that's not exactly the most exciting thing for the people in this room because it's, it's what we do, we do lots. Um, but the, the difference here was the, the, the approach we took and also the course that we were doing it to, because dentistry is a five-year integrated degree, it's not modular, um, and we've only got three teaching themes, which means that we've got three middles per year, which means an awful lot of content in each of the middles, and, and clinical dentistry, the one we're piloting on, is fair to say the biggest. Um, so what we end up with is a file dump with randomly named files, randomly placed, um, the students don't know where things are, the staff aren't sure what file belongs to who, 
So when it comes to this time of year before semester starts, you're trying to clean it up, get rid of the things you don't want students to see. Nobody really takes ownership of individual things. So that, that, there's an issue there. Um, so we've got some data about what the, the staff and students actually think about the current layout. And we found out that 14.8% of students can find resources every time. Um, the rest, no. Um, but that makes sense because only 40% of our staff know where they're supposed to be putting their files. Um, which is, is an issue. The other, the other issue that came out was the added functionality, the use of the active blended tools, the, all the different things that Moodle can do rather than just be a dump. 64% um, of students love this, these resources. They think it would really help their learning. Only 16.7% of staff actually do it. Although on the bright side, 64% of staff say they would love support to be able to do it. So the staff are willing, the students are willing, but the structures at the moment don't really allow it. Um, so it's, it, you know, we'd say break it two phases. We've got let's fix the layouts, and then stage two is let's try and get more active blended learning brought in. That's quite a, a big job, um, and frankly, I wouldn't know where to start. So luckily, we found a framework, um, because there's always frameworks. We love frameworks. Uh, this one is the, the Ad Cola et al. framework, and it's for the holistic framework to support effective institutional transitions into enhanced blended learning. Um, I could spend about an hour going over all the different parts, but the, the key bit for this is the circle in the middle. And I think it's the most important part is stakeholders. Um, and more specifically, your students. Because if, if you don't have the engagement with your students, then what are you doing? Um, so as part of that, we, we decided to create a project team. And we brought in students as partners, as co-creators, and got them involved on the ground floor. They co-own the project. Um, one of them referred to as a hive mind mentality, which is an interesting but nice. Um, so the, the, the staff and student problems we've gone into, it's on the poster. But the challenges we found was organisation, the layout is awful. You know what? See, having students sit down and help you design the layouts makes it so much easier because you remove those assumptions that we have. We know how the course is structured. The students don't. So we are making assumptions that they know what we know. Um, when they're in the room with you saying, that doesn't make sense to us, it makes you realise that, yeah, we should probably listen to them. Um, the awareness is a problem because the staff don't know what blended tools are available. So again, we got the students, we gave them a sandbox access to Moodle to play with the toys, and then when we meet with the staff to say, hey, why don't you try this? The students can put the examples forward and say, here's what we've tried out, here's some examples, why don't you do it in your course? This would really complement your teaching. And all of a sudden the staff are like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll give that a go. Authorization, well, I think we're all aware of the bureaucracy at, at, in higher education. There's a lot of committees and levels to go through. Um, again, having students on side, makes it a lot easier because you say, hey, the students want to do this, so let's do it, and students get what the students want. Um, but the big barrier was time because we're short on time across the board. Um, even just to meet as a project team is really challenging, but I would say we were lucky enough to pilot uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, it made our job a lot easier to work as a team and to move forward with that. I'm running out of time. Um, but what it says, engage your students, trust your students, and you too can turn something like that into something less awful. Thank you. Right then. Now, no pressure, but from my viewpoint, the right was very quiet and largely ineffectual. Oh, sorry, I was taking up about Westminster there, sorry. <laughs> right, this time we'll start off here with a hey, but I want to hear it. A lot more gusto from the right. A little too ready? Are you ready? Yes, sir. Are we ready? <laughs> that was another book. <laughs> Are we ready? So my name is Stuart, I work at Edinburgh Uni, and I'm going to talk about a project we worked on this year, starting in February, called the We Have Great Stuff Colouring Book. I think a lot of you already picked up a copy as my supplies have run out already. So I'm going to take you back in time to December 2017, and we had a staff workshop based on our playful engagement strategy. You can get the link there. 
It was just a sort of brainstorming exercise, people coming up with random ideas to see how they could improve the quality of sort of work and life. And one of the ideas floated was taking advantage of the university's image bank and turn it into a colouring book. So these were very early prototypes. I'm going to take you forward to February this year. So the university runs a week-long series of events called the Festival of Creative Learning. And this is an opportunity for staff and students to run any sort of creative event. This is run from the Institute of Academic Development. And we put forward a proposal to start creating new images from the collection. And we ran two three-hour workshops. So this was the sort of overview, the format of the three-hour session. Students were encouraged to look at the image bank. There's 40,000 images in plus. Most of them are open license CC by. Um, we gave them the means to transform them into black and white outline images and the incentive of putting their efforts into a collaborative publication. So one of the key outcomes of the workshop was learning a new digital skill for the majority of students, and that was using vector drawing tools. We used a uh, open source, well not open source, a free online browser version called Sketchpad, but it's a direct sort of equivalent to Adobe Illustrator. There was, um, everybody started off in the digital method, but some people weren't entirely confident or happy with the results. So the alternative approach we took was the sort of analog solution with pencil um, and tracing paper. And at the end of the workshop, we had an uh, inkjet printer and we printed off their effort and gave them free colour and pencils to actually colour in their designs. And I think that was a nice way of closing the loop of the workshop from start to end. And the very last thing we've done was a friendly competition where um, people uploaded their images to Padlet and voted on somebody else's image. And then we gave out some professional colouring book as prizes. These are just some of my particular favourites that were created. Um, this is a shawl, but I really like how the student just focused on one small area because it's such a detailed image. Um, this one, a magnolia sort of blossom, is beautiful. I think the student had a low confidence level coming into the class. I thought this one was relevant for today. It's a roof plan for McEwen Hall. And this one's a piece of fabric from the art college. And I really like how the student sort of extended the repetition to make sort of a bigger image for the book. And this one, I still can't believe, was created in one go in sort of a three-hour session. And this is one of the students who created the pencil version. And this is the art college from the 1950s. So this is just an overview of some of the feedback from the students. The main things were learning a new digital skill, the sort of relaxed, friendly atmosphere, doing something creative. There was a lot of students from the business school, so I think they appreciated a different opportunity. Um, or I should say... Also, a lot of people didn't know about the Image Bank or the Centre for Research Collections, so they sort of enjoyed hearing about that. We published our book in April. We had 2,000 copies um, distributed through the university libraries. We ran a couple of sessions in April for exam week and for mental health awareness week for staff and students. Um, these are just some of the sort of pop-up things other people um, used with the materials at different library locations. This is just a summary of some of our output. And um, there's a dedicated website I'd encourage you to all have a look at. You can download the book as a PDF. Um, all the images have been uploaded to Flickr. Um, they've already had over 10,000 views. And there are some limited physical copies here today for people. Um, there is a handbook for the workshop. So if you want to run your own, I would encourage you to do so. It's very easy and straightforward. And I would also encourage you to share your efforts online. The library have this hashtag, we have great stuff. And you're welcome to use that or get in touch with me. That's me. Thank you. <laughs> Six seconds to spare. Well done. That's a great project. What do I do with the next session? Colouring it, brilliant stuff. I'll take twice as long and you'll have to drag me off the stage. Brilliant. Yeah? Deal? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're all being too well behaved now. And the fourth day was the best. People running over, mayhem, absolutely brilliant. 
Okay, twice as long. Twice and as you'll long. have to drag me off the stage. Oh, yeah. I have a big <laughs> Okay. Right, we'll, we'll sing again now. Who wasn't here yesterday? You're all here. Okay. We're going to sing to the tune of Doe Deer. Can we just do a quick rehearsal? So it'll be a hyena doe, tree, cat, and cooey. And now you can start your dance. So it'll be a hyena, a doe, a tree, a cat, a cooey. And now you can start your gust. Have we got that one? We do a quick rehearsal. We ready? A hyena, a doe, a tree, a cat, a cooey. And now you can start your gust. Are we ready with that one now? Trying to be to all the men in style. We do like kinesthetic stuff now, and now we're doing it. <laughs> that M Ed was very expensively gained. Are we ready? Now, loud this time. You can join in as well. Are we ready? A hay, a doe, a tree, a car, a cooey, and now you can start your gusta. Thank you. Um, well, um, my talk relates to the fantastic keynote that we had this morning. Uh, we're very passionate about learning through play, and I'm going to share our story. But before I do that, I feel it's really important to highlight who I am and what we do and what our philosophies are. So I was the undergraduate student that was often referred to as lacking confidence. And that's something that as an academic I often think about what does that mean when we say our students lack confidence? So, I'm really in a privileged position because at London South Bank University, I work with South Bank Academies. Our university has sponsored schools, and it's my privilege to work with our schools, work with our young learners and the teachers, and I'm going to share the journey that we've been on for the past couple of years. So, our project, Inventors, has been funded through Erasmus and supported through uh, our university's Centre for Research Informed Teaching and Teaching Investment Fund. We are here to help support school teachers build their uh, digital confidence in the classroom. So we connect teachers with universities, learners with universities, and our students go into the schools and it helps us. So our underpinning philosophy is learning through play, enabled through technology, using as diverse teaching resources as we can in an inclusive environment where curriculum, community, and our, uh, can come together in harmony. And we're gonna say, I'm going to share how we do it. So that word confidence, that's something that I've been thinking about. If the learning context is right, the learners feel engaged. So what we try to do is put a scaffold around the, um, the, the, the learning activities and then ask our young learners to interpret it and to work e with each other in a collaborative way. So our children work with school children across the globe. We have worked with 40 different classrooms in eight different countries, reached more than a thousand students. Uh, we do it by making learning fun. I think I have probably the biggest Lego robotics collection in London. Um, if anyone wants to challenge me later, um, I've got about 40,000 Lego pieces in my office. Uh, we make interactive sessions. We engage our senior staff in the university to work with our children. And our university students engage with uh, the, the school teachers. They work with the children. And together we create an environment whereby the children work on a topic um, around sustainable development environments and they co-create um, stories using Scratch and then they share these stories um, using various different uh, technologies. Um, as part of what we do, not only that we work with our school children, we get our school children to work with primary school kids. And then that, that way, the, 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 the kids feel more confident. They say, okay, we, put, we took part in a robotics activity. We learn from it. They come and give us feedback and say, how could we enhance your robotics activity? And then when we're teaching it to the primary school kids, how could we do that better than you? So I always love the fact that they come and tell me, what you did was not so good. This is how we can do it better. Absolutely love that. 
Uh, as part of my job, I employ student ambassadors. They work with me. They're members of my team. Right now, they are training our graduate interns uh, this whole, throughout this whole week. And our students go into schools. They become role models. It helps boost their confidence levels. It, it gives them employment opportunities, raises their profile. At the same time, we are aware that our school teachers across um, the globe, we've worked with 270 school teachers in different parts of the world. They need support. They need support in terms of grappling with the technologies, whether it's Scratch or blogging tools or the way we operate in terms of our, pro uh, our program. Um, we help them, we support them with their learning needs. Um, we connect the teachers with each other. It was absolutely amazing to watch teachers in Philippines finding each other, knowing that, that the community that they worked with and how close they were to each other in the geographical location. And um, I know I'm running out of time. Hi, These are some of our children and some of the work they have done. Carry on. You'll have to drag me off the stage. Um, so uh, we hey, absolutely a Joe, love a tree, a cutter, a cooing. Start. Thank you. Get the hands up and we're going. Just do that. Come on. was it? Oh, okay, great. Um, thanks for joining me in the graveyard shift here at Alt C 2019. My name is Lisa Donaldson from Dublin City University and this is not where this, it is working fantastic. Um, and in the next four minutes and 59 seconds, I plan to take you through a whistle stop tour of some of the ways and the steps that we've taken to support lifelong learning for our staff at DCU. Now, it's been a while since I've done Agasta, and as Tom will attest, it didn't go so well that time either. So if collectively we make it through this after the late night conference dinner and the 2 a.m. fire alarms, I do have something for everybody in the audience, and I'm going to leave them just here on the front of the stage in case he gets the crook and holds me off before the end. So you can collect those afterwards. Um, in DCU, we launched uh, our learning portfolio initiative in the academic year 2016-2017. So we now have many thousands of students using ePortfolios across all faculties for, uh, to support graduate attributes, to support reflection, for assessment, and for extracurricular activities. So this year, we started to look at how we could utilize the affordances of ePortfolio to support the CPD for our staff. And CPD is a core part of academic practice. So the affordances of ePortfolio lend itself towards that, the ability to have an online space whereby you can showcase multiple media that you can personalize and that you can share with perhaps accrediting bodies or if you're going for promotion or another job. So ePortfolio offers a lot of adva advantages there. And what you're seeing there is just a, a snapshot of our ePortfolio system, which is based on Mahara. So these are just a few of the initiatives that we've been working on in this last year. Some are in very early stages. We have recently ad um, adopted the uh, Advanced HE Fellowship Scheme, and what we are currently doing with the first cohort that are going through, it is very much a paper-based exercise, but we're looking, and here's a sample on the left, we're looking that eventually that will move to ePortfolio to showcase the learning and accomplishment of our academics. Another area that we're in, working with in conjunction with HR is the Learn and Grow initiative for our researchers. And we've developed a customized ePortfolio template based on researcher specific competencies that they will be able to use to, again, showcase their, excuse me, their skills. I have no spit left at all. Showcase their skills. So um, 
that's going to roll out shortly as well. Within the TEU, Teaching Enhancement Unit, of which I'm a part, we offer many workshops to our staff, and we've created customised for every single workshop that we offer, uh, reflection templates, which we now automatically send out after the workshops. There's no requirement for the participants to complete, th complete them, but we are hoping that we can encourage ongoing reflection on the workshops that they take with us. And this year, for our Teaching Excellence Awards, we introduced e-portfolios for all our shortlisted candidates. And this greatly enhanced the evaluation process, but more importantly, the, the candidates then had an online showcase of their teaching philosophy uh, statements, their um, teaching and learning initiatives, their assessment initiatives. And perhaps one of the biggest things that we did this year, under the auspices of ePortfolio Ireland, which is a national community of practice for ePortfolio, which comes out of Dublin City University, is that we de designed and put on a Design Your Professional Portfolio workshop. So this was a half-day workshop whereby we wanted to encourage everybody to walk the walk and have their own professional portfolio. So what you're seeing there are some of the, the core areas that we, we looked at including in a portfolio. And they were informed by the frameworks that you see on screen. So the professional development framework in Ireland, the UK professional standards framework, and our own DCU academic development and promotion framework. And that's what you have here on the front of the stage. It's those categories or sections that if you are looking to showcase your own CPD, these are the ones he's going to start walking. These are the things that you should look at having in your e-portfolio. So uh, I'd like to invite you to take one of those when I'm hauled off the stage and hopefully it could be a starting point for your own professional portfolio. Thank you. That last one went well. The intro, I think that went well. I like that. But we need a bit more volume. So for the person, the second time we shout out gossip, that's your cue to go. Are we ready? Let's get the hands going. Hi, um, so my name is Andrew Millington and I'm a developer from the University of Edinburgh. I'm going to speak about how we used LTI to extend our VLE. So two years ago I became involved in the academic blogging service, which is a central blogging service for the University of Edinburgh that is used primarily to um, support teaching and learning activities. And when we were setting up this project we had a number of requirements for it. We wanted it to be easy to use with low barrier to entry, ideally integrated into our virtual learning environment. We also wanted it to be customizable because we acknowledged that not every blog would have the same purpose. So we wanted to have different tools available to the blog authors and we also wanted to have different uh, themes and looks. We also wanted it to be portable. So we wanted the blog authors to be able to own their actual content. If they wanted to, they would be free to download the blog and lift it and put it on another platform of their choice. We also wanted the blog to be public um, or private if they wished. If it was public, they would be able to share their ideas outside of the normal um, university colleagues and perhaps with the wider world to get more ideas. And finally, as a bonus, we would have liked it to have been an open source platform as well so that we could understand what the system was doing with our data and also we could use the developers at the university to expand upon the service if we wanted to. So in our commercial uh, VLE, we have a blogging system, but unfortunately, as you'll all know, VLEs tend to be Swiss Army knives. They provide a lot of different tools, but they're not always the best ones for the job. For example, you're not going to use that little corkscrew to open up a bottle of wine if you have a fancy corkscrew um, in your kitchen with the little handles on that you can pop up easily. And that's what we felt about the blogging system in our commercial VLE. It didn't allow us to make our blogs public. It didn't allow us to easily download that data. It didn't allow us to easily extend that or change the look and feel of it. But it did integrate well with the virtual learning environment. However, there was a system that did work well for most of our requirements, and this was WordPress. WordPress allowed us to customize the VLE. It allowed us to download and export the data. It allowed us to make the blogs public, and with a bit of tweaking, we could make it private as well. But the one thing that was missing for us is it wasn't easy to integrate with our existing tools and our virtual learning environment. 
Now, in the PHP world, you have web application frameworks, and I'm a PHP developer, and web application frameworks give you the bare, the bare tools to make any web application. So this is data into database integration, email integration, form validation. And CodeIgniter up the top there used to be the um, Swiss army knife of, uh, of the PHP framework world. And as time went on, people realized that the tools that it was using weren't always needed or weren't required. So Laravel and Symfony came about, and they were more modularized. They allowed you to rip out bits and pieces of it and replace it with systems that you wanted to instead. And that became a big mess because people realized that they weren't that always interchangeable. So something came about in 2013 called the PHP Framework Interoperability Group, which writes standards. And these standards say how these modules work. So you can now take modules from Symfony and put them in Laravel, and you can take modules from Laravel and put them in Symfony. And I would love for a VLE to work like this and have standardizations and modularizations like this. Unfortunately, we don't. So we have the next best thing, which is the LTI standard. Now, this won't replace the blogging system in our VLE, but what it will do is it will allow us to use a different blogging system if we want to. It's a mechanism for securely transferring data from the virtual learning environment to an external tool. And the data that we transfer, first name, last name, email address, the role within the VLE, and so on. It eliminates multiple logins. If you're logged into the virtual learning environment, then by a simple click of a link, you will go into the blogging system. If you don't have an account there, it will create one for you based on the data that's been passed across. If you do have an account, it will log you into the blogging service. So it provides seamless transitions between learning tools. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to be able to easily uh, cut down the barriers to use WordPress as a, as a tool for our blogging service. So what we did was we created a WordPress LTI plugin. And this plugin has two modes available to it. The first is a course blog mode, and what that means is that if you have an LTI link in your course, then anyone that clicks on that will be added to the same blog. So all students will participate in a single blog. Alternatively, you can have a student blog mode, which means that any student that clicks on the link will get their own blog, and the lecturer will be added to that blog as well. And when the lecturer logs into WordPress, they will see a list of all of the student blogs that are associated with a particular course to be able to go in and read about them. We've made this uh, plugin open source. Um, it's available at github.com forward slash UOE dash DLAM forward slash ed LTI, and it's licensed under the GNU version three uh, license. We wanted to do this to allow people to download it, so please go and try it out, and yeah, hopefully you'll be able to extend your VLE as well. Thank you. Too good. So. Round of applause to all the Gossetiers. Would you all please stand up, please, all the presenters, the Gossetiers. <laughs> Not easy. Big round of applause. And can I just say thanks to all of you as well. Gossetier only works by participation, so. Oh, I'll tell you why. You weren't sitting in the right place. Your chance is gone. <laughs> okay. I can't guarantee five minutes, though. We'll, we'll be quick. No, no, we'll be joking. Okay, even better. Because I, I, I knew I had, I had one more, so I started to doubt myself, which is never. I put it down to the four o'clock in the morning. Matter. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high. Martin, please. Stop me singing and get that thing to work. I'm running out of songs to sing. I'm here we go. Are we ready? Yes. Gotta be up on the one, down on the two, up on the three, down on the four, up on the five. Hands up, and I mean the loudest shout of gossip for the whole day. Particularly the people up in the cheap seats. Yeah, you, you know, your bum has sat on a nice soft seat for the whole day, and poor lads are sitting on the wood. Are we ready? Ah, uh, hey! Uh, I'm watching. Stop, 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 stop. There's people not doing it. Right? It's one last thing. People say, oh, the graveyard shift, I'm falling asleep. I'm giving you an opportunity to stand up. I'm making sure to not waffle on for more than five minutes. Even if it's. So, all we ask is get the blood flowing. Are we ready? Sweat that drink out of you. Are we ready? Ah, uh, hey! Ah, uh, Joe! A tree, a car, a cooing. Okay, hello. Uh, we're last but hopefully not least. 
Um, I'm Cara, and this is my colleague Lucy. And as you can see from our first slide, this is what we do. Between us, we have over a decade's experience working within higher education as digital media producers, generating a wide variety, variety of video and audio assets. We wanted to share with you today one or two of the common assumptions and misconceptions that we've encountered surrounding approach to creating media content that, if overlooked, can hinder an institution's development of sustainable media practices. So this quote is from a paper that presents an overview of current video practices and reflects on the relevance of production value in support of learning. So the quote reads, we encourage an approach that prioritizes learning and pedagogy over glossy high production value videos. A DIY approach to production prioritizes media literacy for content experts. So while no one can argue with the fact that learning and pedagogy is always the priority, here, and from our experience, this value is separated from the contribution of the media expert. If I was someone without media experience reading this, I would be forgiven for thinking that media specialists only contribute superficially to the making of media assets. But media specialists offer something other than merely glossy high production values. Collaboration with the media expert will allow you to define your goals and approach, be it DIY or otherwise. And to define quality, you have to create a brief. Any quality output is output that meets that brief. High production values isn't just gloss. It's meeting your learning goals in the most efficient and impactful way. And media producers can support those learning goals. We're trained in knowing what approach will best communicate your content. That's our value. So here's Shai. He's one of our course leaders at Edinburgh Business School. And Mary Jane, who's there as well, is our content developer. Neither of them had any experience of working with media before Lucy and I came on board with the team. We've collaborated with them over the course of a year, developing media content for the new MBA program. And as you can see from the photos, we've created a wide variety of outputs and approaches. And so here is what Shai and Mary Jane have got to say about their experience. Well, it started with no experience at all. I didn't know what to expect with the media. I kind of thought that would be something where we just, you would just get on with it. <laughs> and we wouldn't need to be involved. I, I couldn't understand what is expected out of me. Um, what constraints are involved, it was really, really hard. But what I liked about getting involved was seeing how things are set up, seeing how different it is speaking to camera, doing a piece to camera from writing something and, and what different language you need to use and different skills. I can more and more understand how videos interact together with the other material. So hopefully you can hear from them, and there's the transcript that you can look at, um, how this really has been a process. It's much more of a dialogue. It's a nurturing of trust and mutual respect. And this kind of leads to an emerging voice and identity, which you could call media literacy. So rather than separating media specialist from content, and that's really anyone involved in content, whether that's a learning technologist or designer, whether it's an academic, integrating them into your culture is absolutely key to sustainable practices. And that's us integrating <laughs> with our team behind the light board. Um, we can help you to find your voice, and once it's there, optimize its impact. So collaborate with media specialists for a literate and therefore authentic and therefore sustainable practice. Um, our poster expands on that further and please get in touch um, if you have any questions we've got lots of references lots of resources lots of ideas thank you tom well done well done well done and once again a round of applause for all the gustateers not just today but over the three days well done thank you very much before he disappears entirely, I wanted to just say thank you to Tom Farrelly, who's been hosting 
27 papers at this conference single-handedly, and I always feel that he really brings heart to giving researchers and practitioners the opportunity to share their newest work with the biggest possible audience that our community can offer. So please put your hands together to Tom Farrelly. Adina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with multiple, our Jupyter Notebook servers. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology.